Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and I call my Friday sessions Responding to the Critics. I normally, uh, at the suggestion of others, of books, articles, uh, speeches, and what have you, uh, I take a look at those articles and books and what have you that have addressed and condemned covenant eschatology. And I respond to those books. I have currently been, this is video number 35, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in response to my friend, Steve Gregg, entitled Why Not Full Preterism. Now, in 2012, Steve and I had a two-day formal debate held in Denver, Colorado, sponsored by my friend, Mike Zeman. During that debate, uh, to be very candid about it, Steve didn't do a very good job. And I'm not the only one who's said that. I'm not the only one who has expressed that. And by the way, there are a large number of people who are now full preterists as a direct result of that debate. These are people who are futurists, just like Steve Gregg, but as a direct result of the debate, they're now full preterists. That's not a, not a brag, it's just a simple fact. People have contacted me and told me of how profoundly the debate impacted them. Well, we always appreciate hearing things like that. So, Steve, after the debate, wrote this book entitled, Why Not Full Preterism? This book is very obviously an attempt to recover, to rescue himself from his debate performance. In the book, he mentions me by name 140 times. Now, I don't, I'm not offended by that at all. Uh, as I've said many times, Steve's a real nice guy, very amiable, uh, easy to get along with, very courteous. Our, our debate was a, uh, the epitome uh, of courteousness and decorum. Uh, it's the way biblical debate ought to be done. All right. So thoroughly enjoyed it. Absolutely enjoyed it. So this is video number 35 in my review of his book. So we come now to page 197. And like I've told you, I'm not going to try to examine every single point that Steve makes in the book attempting to refute covenant eschatology. However, when we come to chapter 10, we're dealing with what Steve considers the, uh, the coup de grace. The, the singular most destructive argument against preterism to be found. He cites Jesus' debate with the Sadducees, who came to him, Luke chapter 20, 30 and following, and said, Master, I have a question for you. A certain man had a wife. He died without producing children. His brother took her to wife, produced no children, and died. In all, there were seven brothers, all of whom took her to wife and produced no heirs. So in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? And so Jesus responded by telling them, in the age to come, there is neither marriage nor giving in marriage. For like the, they're like the angels and cannot die. For they're sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Those who are counted worthy to attain that age do not marry. Now, you might ought to hang on to that term, that phrase, those who are counted worthy to attain that age. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just kind of dangling that out there in front of you to contemplate, to think about, to study, to research. You mean you've got to be qualified to enter into the age to come? According to Jesus, those who are counted worthy to enter the age to come. It's fascinating. Okay, so anyway. Here's what Steve says on page 198. It would be hard to find a passage 
that is prima facie more hostile to the full printer's claim that the resurrection occurred in AD 70 than the response Jesus gave to the Sadducees concerning marriage in the new age or in the, in the resurrection. And so Steve says, this is it. Luke chapter 20 and the parallels, of course, of Matthew chapter 22 and the issue of marrying and no marrying in the age to come. It's the fatal blow to preterism. Well, I've got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I was a little surprised when I read his comments here on page 198. I was just really quite taken back. I thought Steve knew what the real answer to that passage is. A little bit of background, and that's what Steve proceeds to, to give on page 198 and 199, uh, and that's the contextual background for the argument. Now, remember, the Pharisees believed in resurrection. Sadducees did not. Sadducees did not believe in life after death. They didn't believe in the age to come. They didn't believe in any of those eschatological elements and tenets that the Pharisees believed in, all right? They had debated with the Pharisees a lot. The question that they came to Jesus with was very clearly a question that they had posed to the Pharisees on many different occasions, and the Pharisees had no answer for it. Now, it's critical that you understand what Steve admits on page 199. The challenge of the Sadducees was based upon the ancient custom called Leverite marriage, or Leverate, according to some, from the Latin word Lever, meaning husband's brother. We would call him a brother-in-law. This custom was practiced in ancient Middle Eastern culture, even in the days of the patriarchs, but later became formally encoded in the Torah. Under this law, if a married man died, leaving no heir to his estate, his nearest relative, usually his brother, was obliged to marry the dead man's widow in order to produce an heir for the de deceased and perpetuate his name. Ch the child would then be regarded as that of the deceased brother, the mother's first husband. The law seemed to imply that if the second brother failed to have a son by the brother's widow prior to his own death, then the next brother or the next of kin would have to marry her, and so uh, until she had a son. This admission, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, is more than stunning. The admission that this question is based upon the continuance of the law of Moses in the age to come. That is the fundamental assumption being made by the Sadducees. While Steve admits that, he doesn't examine the implications of the importance of that admission. Very quickly, a couple of things. Point number one, this no marrying or giving in marriage would be the state or the condition in, quote, the age to come. Now, here's what you have to understand. I, and I wrote a book on this several years ago, Marrying and Giving in Marriage in the New Creation, question mark. Okay? And I go over this in great detail. What you have to understand is that it is a given among scholars, among both rabbis and biblical scholars, the Jews only believed, and Jesus only believed, in two ages. They believed in the law and in the age of Moses and the law. We call that today the Mosaic Age. They believed in the age to come, by the way, the age of Moses and the law is what they referred to as this age. The age to come was the age of Messiah and the new covenant. Are you following closely here? This age, the age of Moses and the law, 
the age to come, the age of Messiah, and the new covenant. Third point, and again, I point all of this out in my book. Okay, third point, the age of Moses in the law was supposed to end. It is the only age that was to end. You got to catch that. The age of Moses and the law was supposed to end, and the age of Moses and the law was the only, pardon, the only age that was supposed to end. The age of Messiah, the new covenant, and the kingdom was to never end. The book of Baruch, which of course is not canonical, but nonetheless expresses the Jewish view that the age of Messiah would never pass away. Well, that's Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. In the days of the fourth empire, i.e. the Roman Empire, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never pass away. Well, if the kingdom never passes away, the, the kingdom age never passes away. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. When Christ ascended to the Father, According to Luke chapter 19, he sat down at the right hand, having received the kingdom, and it was, a, it was a kingdom which will never pass away. Now, by the way, Daniel chapter 7, 13, 14 is not talking about the ascension. Luke 19 is talking about the ascension to the right hand, to the throne. Daniel chapter 7 is a judgment scene. When the kingdom was given to Christ, when he destroyed the little horn. I can't go on and on that at this particular time, but this is critical. Okay, so what's the point? Here's Steve Gregg's view. Okay, this age is just time. We're looking for, in reality, the age to come. Now, Steve equivocates on this. He understands that the law of Moses passed away. He understands that we're now living in the kingdom. But what does he do? He says the current age, the Christian age, is the age in which marriage and marrying and giving in marriage is being practiced. Wait a minute. No, it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, what age was Jesus, number one, living in? when he was talking to the Sadducees. Point number two, living in that age, which was his, this age, what law of marriage was in a force? Oh, Deuteronomy 25, the Leverite marriage law that the Sadducees are using for the foundation of their argument and their question. Jesus was looking to the time, not to the end of the Christian age. You see, in, <laughs> in order to, for Steve's argument to have any val validity whatsoever, Jesus had to be living in the age in which the Leverite marriage was still mandated. So according to Steve's position, logically implied, logically implied, Deuteronomy 25 is still applicable now. Well, if C were to come back and say, well, no, 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 the Levitical uh, marriage law, the Leverite marriage law, excuse me, uh, it's no longer valid today because the law passed away. Okay, then there is no marrying and giving in marriage according to the law, which is the very basis of the Sadducean argument. You see, what Steve is doing he is setting the context for the Sadducees' question and the Sadducean controversy. He's setting that entirely aside and saying, well, Jesus changes the subject from the Leverite marriage 
which is the specific focus of the Sadducees. He changes the subject from the Leverite marriage, and he changes the subject from the continuing validity of the law in the age to come. That's what Steve does. Because you see, the Sadducees were assuming, just like the Pharisees believed, they were assuming the law of Moses would continue valid, and thus the Leverite marriage would continue in the age to come. Well, what stands between, in Jewish thought, in Jesus' thought, in Luke chapter 22, Matthew, or Luke 20 and Matthew 22, what stood between this age and the age to come? The resurrection. So the resurrection would lead to usher in the age to come in which the law of Moses would no longer be binding, in which the Leverat law would no longer be binding. So let me ask you a question, folks. Are you and I today, as Christians, living in the age to come that came after the passing of the law of Moses, the passing of the Leverite marriage? <laughs> would anyone deny that? Would any Christian actually deny that? We are clearly, undeniably, unequivocally, irrefutably, living in the age that was to come after the passing of the age in which the Leverite marriage was practiced. It's not even debatable. And by the way, let me point something out to you that's absolutely critical. What was the purpose of the Leverite marriage? Well, it was to maintain the family name. It was to produce sons of God. Mm -mm -mm. Let me say that again. The Leverite marriage law was given to ensure the passing on of the name and thus, and also, the creation of sons of God. Folks, how were sons of God made under the law? Oh, marrying, giving in marriage, the natural conjugal relations between husband and wife that produced children through the flesh, through the will of man, and producing sons of God who, by the way, they were born and then they were taught who they were, what they were. But Jesus said in the age to come, sons of God have produced their resurrection. So let me ask you, what did Paul have to say about sons of God being produced? Oh, let me see. You are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. For there is neither Jew or Greek. There was under the law of Moses. There was neither bond or free. There was. If you're a Christ, then are you Abraham's seed? How do we become Abraham's seed? Under Torah, you became Abraham's seed by being the result of man and woman. Today, sons of God are produced by faith. Not by man, not by the will of man, nor the will of the flesh, but by faith. John chapter 1, 10 and following. And oh, by the way, in Romans chapter 6, what did Paul says? Do you not know that so many of us as we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Okay, what did Paul say in Galatians 3, 26 and 27? Sons of God by faith, being baptized into Christ, putting Christ on. Romans 6, being baptized into Christ and his death, being raised, you know, that's resurrection. 
to walk in newness of life. Resurrection, sonship. Resurrection by faith and baptism. And when did that come about? It didn't come about through Torah observance and marrying and giving in marriage according to the flesh. Sons of God today are not produced by marrying and giving in marriage. Sons of God today, today, in the age in which we are living, which is the age that followed Jesus' this age, which was the age of Moses, the law, and the Leverite marriage, the age in which we are living now, sons of God, are produced by faith. Being raised with Christ in baptism to be made an heir of Abraham. Folks, this is not a contrast. This is not this age versus the age to come. But here's the problem. See, Greg says, the current age in which we are living is not the age being described by Jesus. Because after all, Jesus said the age to come would be ushered in by the resurrection. And Steve Gregg believes the resurrection is the raising of biological bodies out of the dirt. But wait a minute. Remember, Jesus said, those who are worthy to attain that age, the age to come, do not marry, nor are they given in marriage, neither can they die, they're like the angels. Oh, by the way, <laughs> what did Jesus say in John 8, 51, if a man keep my saying, he will never die? He will never die. Is that true today? in the age in which we are living, which followed Jesus is this age. Uh, you know, all of those who are under the law were under a curse. Galatians 3.13. Galatians 2.10. Why? Well, because they couldn't keep the law perfectly. That's why. Therefore, they were living in a covenant of death, in administration of death. Today, in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk after the flesh, but the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death was fully operative under and was the strength of Torah. You sin, you die. The gospel sets us free from the law of sin and death. What does that mean? means we don't die. We're not talking biological death here, folks. I met a guy many years ago. I was speaking at a conference, and this guy came up to me. And he said, well, I don't, you know, you're absolutely totally false because he said, Jesus said, if a man believes on me, he will never die. And he said, I'm never going to die. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying you're never going to die physically? He said, that's precisely what I'm saying because that's what Jesus said. And he was an old man at the time. And I said, let me ask you a question. I said, how old are you? He said, 86. I believe that's what he said. I said, well, sir, with all due respect, you're going to die physically. He said, I am not. I said, well, sir, I'm not going to argue about it, but believe you me, you're going to die physically. He did. As we all do. But Jesus said, those who believe in him, who keep his commandments, will never die. Even though we die physically, we shall live. And if we believe in him, we will never die. Well, that can't be physically because he just said, if a man believes on me, even though he dies. You see, we have to catch the nuances of what Jesus was saying. So the final point that I want to make this morning, and again, I develop it fully in my book, Marrying and Giving in Marriage in the New Creation, question mark, is that we today 
living under the new covenant, living under the, under the Messiah and his new covenant. We are living in the age that Jesus and the Jews was anticipating. They were living under the law of Moses in which the Leverite marriage was mandated. They were looking to the time in which the law of Moses would be taken out of the way. By the way, a real quick diversion for those of my friends who are, quote, Torah observance. Do you practice the Leverite marriage? If not, why not? That's a legitimate question, folks. And don't tell me, well, part of the law passed away, but part of it didn't. We're, we're, under, we're not under the sacrifices, although there are some Torah observant people who offer animal sacrifices today. Well, if you offer animal sacrifices today, then you ought to be practicing the Leverite marriage because that's ever bit as much a part of the Le uh, Levitical law, uh, the Mosaic law, as the sacrifices. Okay, enough of that. So, final point here. You and I today, under Christ, are living in the age to come. That means that in some way, somehow, we're living in the time of no marrying and giving in marriage. That means, simple, simply stated, we're not living under the law of Moses. Final point, because I'm running out of time here. Steve Gregg says that the age in which we are living, which is the age that followed the law of Moses, which is the age to come from the perspective of the law. But he says, the age in which we are living today, the Christian age, will one day come to an end. But you see, that goes back to the, what I shared with you earlier, and that is that according to the rabbis, according to the Bible, according to Jesus, according to Paul, there are only two ages, this age and the age to come. When Steve Gregg says the current Christian age is going to end, he is an overt violation of what the Bible says. Ephesians 3, 20 and 20, 21, unto him, be glory, him, that is the Father, be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, age without end. That's where we're at today, ladies and gentlemen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 to 28, the writer says, that they were in the process at that very time of receiving a kingdom which can never be moved. Now, that never be moved in the context means it can never cease to function. It can never be taken out of the way. Well, guess what? If you remove the gospel, if we come to a time in which, for instance, there's no more evangelism, then the gospel ceases to function and the gospel is therefore removed. But the writer of Hebrews says, the gospel will never be moved. In Revelation chapter 11, 15 and following, at the time of the destruction of the city where the Lord was crucified, it says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall rule and reign forever and forever. G.K. Bill, commenting on the Greek of that text, said it's the very strongest Greek expression for endlessness that they had. That came at the time of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. That means, ladies and gentlemen, the Christian age is not going to end to bring in another age to come in which there's no marrying. The very reality that you and I are living in the age to come, which was that was from the Jewish perspective of the law of Moses, the fact that we are now in that age proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're living in the age in which there is neither male or female, not in Christ. And you know, for neither male or female, it's kind of tough to be married, isn't it? but we are living in the time in which there is no marrying and giving in a marriage in order to ensure the inheritance, in order to produce sons of God. Inheritance is by faith. Sons of God are produced by faith. We are in the age to come. And that means if we are children of God, 
we will never die. I don't know what's so anathema about that. I don't know what's such a bad news about that. Let me urge you to go to my website, purchase a copy of my book, Marrying and Giving in Marriage in the New Creation. I wish I could offer free shipping on this. I simply can't. The book is priced very, very economically. Uh, cost of shipping would eliminate, you know, any possibility of making even a dime on it, basically. So please, uh, please order a copy of the book. You'll be glad you did. Thanks for joining me. By the way, I won't be able to be with Mike Sullivan for a, another version of Preterist Apologetics. Had some things come up schedule-wise that I can't get out of. So we'll do that next week, Lord willing. In the meantime, have a fantastic weekend. See you on Monday.